we're going to start our program tonight. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, the title for this Powered by Petra Kucha event is Adaptive Architecture Showcase, Work in Progress 2013. Um, for those in the audience that have not heard of Petra Kucha, or uh, Petra Kucha nights are informal and fun gatherings that where creative people gather together to share their ideas, work, thoughts, holiday snaps, or just about anything really in the Petra Kucha 20 by 20 format. Um, Petra Kucha 20 by 20 is a simple presentation format where you show 20 images each for 20 seconds. The images advance automatically and you talk along to the images. The concise presentation is about six minutes and 40 seconds. We'll first start off with a few slides from the Petra Kucha network. So our first presenter today is Wendy Falk. Uh, she is a doctorate, doctoral candidate at the Harvard GSD and also an assistant professor of digital media and design program at the University of Houston. The title of the presentation is Cross-Pollination of Ideas. So please welcome Wendy. Hey, um, I hope uh, you guys aren't like falling asleep from your food or something. Um, I mean, it's going to be a quick presentation, and then I usually start off with like all my lectures this way, but it's like five minutes, so it's not going to bore you. Um, if you guys could start it up, it would be awesome. It has a little bit of music. It's like two, three seconds worth of slides, each slide, and sound. Okay. So there's no copyright infringement. It's M83. Um, and the project I'm actually going to do is like, I talk about the processes of how I work in my uh, practice, how I teach. It's usually utilizing digital tooling, physical experiments, and material studies, and how I loop it back and I kind of see if there's a feedback system. So the next few projects that you're going to see are a few projects that we've done myself in my practice, and also with uh, actually a few of the people here. This project was done for Asian Society in Hong Kong. I was exploring uh, different types of geometric shapes. I was working with a fabricator engineer in Shanghai. Um, and it's a quick turnaround. I was very surprised. We did it in like five weeks. And we got an amazing cu uh, kind of curator to work with, who's also the director of um, the Mori Art Museum, and got into this ex amazing experience with this project. So from there, uh, I also did a recent installation for uh, London Design Week. And it's called Systematic Narcissism. It's a project that we were experimenting with uh, mostly Python scripting and different iterations, looking at flat cut and just kind of hands on uh, playing with more of the CNC. And then we looked at the kind of mirroring effect of things. And this was, we also got an A plus uh, Architizer finalist for this project for architecture and fabrication. Moving on from that, back to Toronto. This is for the design festival, I think, last year or something like that. And we were working with uh, Overstock Materials uh, with Contractor. And the experimentation at first, we were very uh, optimistic in thinking that, okay, we're able to use different types of form, form finding with just CNC and uh, vacuum forming, did not work. So we went back to the drawing board and we went and used uh, kind of, there's a lot of biographical information I'm not showcasing here, but actually the shadows are different cities. Um, I could probably show you more something more in detail if you'd like to see later on. Again, I'm doing this really quickly. Um, and then from Shanghai, I don't know if Michael or Alvin or any of these guys are here, but um, I work with them on this project uh, for the MOCA, which is the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Shanghai. And it's actually part of their permanent collection, and it was based on a Frey Auto idea. Um, it's an amazing experience. We worked with the USC students, and this is actually uh, vacuum formed, and it's on the terrace. And it was also a very short, like, one and a half month project. And from there, uh, there's another project in Singapore that I work with Fabricator with. Got amazing sponsorship uh, from DuPont Korean, and also the next phase of this project is working with LG Hymax, um, so LG company. And we worked on several different prototypes. This is currently under discussion still to get it professionally fabricated, and we're still on the talks, and we're very happy with that. So moving on from that, back to Alan Turing. 
Uh, in Houston, uh, I'm actually leading a program, uh, I'm an assistant professor there, and it's been a great experience. I have my students here, and we'll see them later on. Um, we're, we're working on archiving of different uh, tooling, machining, and also I'm very into like, 3D printing, and that's what I'm like, working on my doctoral, is looking at uh, the legality of things and kind of playing with that for use a bit. So a lot, a lot of what we're trying to do with the workshop there as a very famous tooling center um, is to kind of archive a way of uh, how the students could use the form work, use the tool bits, and play with different basic materials, but also to kind of formulate their own dialogue on how they could actually further retooling and apply it. It's more like applied research. So essentially, it's, it's been quite fun there. I'm taking a lead right now, so because I'm doing my doctoral, but it's, it's been an amazing experience with the students. I've only been there for like two years, and the faculty there is also very supportive, and the dean's been really amazing. So from that, back to Toronto, and this is where I think you guys need to come up. So three of my students are here, and this is the project that we work with the Judd Foundation. Uh, it was more of a, a project. Come on, come on, guys. Uh, it's a project that we did uh, that I, I derived. As, it's more of a pedagogy course. So what we were trying to do was looking at entrepreneurship, looking at a business model. They did actually a, a Kickstarter-ish kind of funding, and it was looking at how do you actually activate the current economic climate and creating your own job. So that's essentially, we tried. It, the team was like 15 students, I would say, right? So about 15 students, so we divided the whole team into uh, different ways of working uh, with the design team, with the business team, and a technical team. And, and you could actually see that, it's on display. I'll have David talk a little bit about it. Yeah, how's it going? I'm David. Um, yeah, just uh, quickly explain that project. It's essentially a take on Marfa, Texas, if anyone's ever been to Marfa, Texas or knows anything about it. It's just a small West Texas town where uh, the artist Donald Judd made his home. And really the whole town is kind of like played on like an art scene and then kind of just being remote that you can kind of, you know, just kind of do weird art things. And so really the whole project was uh, in collaboration with the Judd Foundation and it's really playing also with the uh, Marvel Lights, this funny trend, uh, this almost like alien light uh, phenomena that happens in that landscape, so uh, that's why we chose to use the lights and um, just kind of play with the landscape. So they're still trying to fund this project, if you guys want to help them out, feel free to check out their <laughs> website, we'll send it to you guys later, um, and yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, so um, our next presenter is Achilles Sidis, and he is from ETH Zurich, and the title of his presentation is Resonance 2. Hi, um, it's a bit new to me, this Pachacuzo, we don't have it in Europe. At least I didn't have it, yeah. So anyway, um, I'll do my best. And also because I was working a whole week casting stuff like that, um, it's gonna be more like reading a text, so it's not. Anyway, uh, Resonance uh, is an experimental installation that uh, emphasizes new material techniques, interaction, and networked intelligence in a form of complex emerged behavior. We designed the first version of, uh, as a part of a course in the post-professional master course at the chair of uh, CAD at ETH Zurich. Uh, together with Manuel Kretzer, who is somewhere here. Um, the second version is now uh, exhibited at the school. So the first version of uh, Resonance Project started as an investigation into smart material, specifically the combination of uh, plastic materials such as polyester resin together with thermochromic pigments. But what we ended up was an uh, experience in uh, multidisciplinary making. Our research combined a series of experiments into the qualities and the capabilities of the resin in, uh, and the pigment. Digital fabrication techniques in relation to forming the material, experiments in integration design with a range of sensors and, actu and actuators to work together with the pigment, and in visualization techniques using both grasshopper and coding processing. 
Um, the modules that we designed um, vibrate and slowly shift color in response to touch and uh, are activated by embedded electronics and wireless communications, which extended the interaction uh, response through neighborhood and colonies in complex and uh, emerged uh, patterns. So the resonance uh, was conceived at the three different levels. Levels: the cell, which is the individual, the component; the colony, which uh, consists of three elements. It used to be four, uh, and the uh, ecology, which is the whole uh, system. Um, when someone touches one of the cells, it uh, shivers in response and starts to change color. How much it shivers uh, and the, the extent of its color change is a function of each cell's popularity. But the interactions quickly become uh, much more interesting. Um, each individual cell is created uh, using um, reusable mold uh, made uh, out of uh, polypropylene uh, sheets uh, with uh, a rotational molding technique. Parts of the mold are laser cut from acrylic and are formed into, into and bonded with the, the resin. These provide more geometrically precise areas to mount our electronic components, such as the heaters, the fans, the vibrating motors, and yeah, basically everything that needed to be precisely mounted on the elements. Because the resin is capable of taking uh, on many different tactile qualities, as well as the use of uh, temperature and vibration, it was important that the installation responds dynamically to touch. In the first version of Resonance, we used vibra vibration sensors to sense uh, human touch. In the new version, we've used uh, capacitive sensing, uh, further doping the polyester resin by casting a conductive uh, mesh into the resin during the molding process. So we can sense and um, react with a greater degree of accuracy to human interaction. So all of us, uh, we might be familiar with uh, thermochromism from uh, things like uh, hypercolor shirts and other disgusting stuff in uh, toilets and anyway. We're using a powdered, um, powdered pigment that uh, changes color at a certain temperature from uh, colored to white. So by combining pigments um, that react in different temperatures, for example, here you can see uh, a blue pigment that uh, changes color at 30 and a red pigment that changes color at 43. Uh, we are able to shift uh, through a range of uh, colors and combinations which interact with the inaccuracies involved in the casting process uh, to create unique patterns of the, on the individual modules. Each colony of uh, three cells is uh, controlled by Arduino with a custom Arduino shield that we designed for this project. This shield is uh, connected to the whole uh, installation using uh, XB wireless radio so that the interaction at each point ripples through the installation. Mm. The behavior of the installation as a, a whole mirrors the evolution and propagation of color and pattern in symbol life forms, a series of symbol responses which uh, form a complex phenomena uh, which, sorry, from which color uh, a complex uh, phenomena emerge. As well as the individual uh, response, each cluster communicates with the whole and reports on its condition, as well as responding to its neighbor conditions. So we begin to see field effects, ripples, and waves of uh, visual and tactile information. From the humble beginning, we can uh, begin to imagine architecture that uh, evolve with us over time, walls that uh, have memory, that shift um, with our mood or with the light, that have a tactile quality and that uh, responds haptically to our touch. And that's the end of the text uh, that uh, was emailed to me a few hours ago. Uh, um, yeah, the first team, okay, you can't see it, but um, uh, feel free to come and uh, play with it at the, I don't know the name of the room, 
on the second floor, somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, come and play with it, uh, and because it needs interaction, it needs uh, people to touch it in order to do something. So, thanks. Okay, so we're actually going to start off with our next performance of presenter, and our next presenter is Jean-Michel Cretes, and he is from Los Angeles. The title of his project is Pendulum Field. Hello, everybody. OK, here we are. OK, this is not going to be a grand show off. I'm not going to tell you about my round the world trips or my last stay in a Buddhist uh, convent or uh, whatever life experience. I'm going to be reasonably serious, trying to um, give you an insight of uh, this new kinetic work that we produced uh, as, a, as a team from a number of uh, students from a number of different schools in, in, uh, on, from LA. This is going almost too fast. Um, let me dive right into it. Um, it's a pendulum field uh, that consists out of 233 uh, pendulums that are um, supported uh, by little structures uh, made out of one-arm pendulums um, floating above um, um, a parabolic-shaped um, mirror. The, energies that this um, kinetic works uh, thrives of is essentially untangible energy, energy that is not prim primarily directly visible. Uh, it deals with electromagnetic and earth magnetic energies opposed to the work that engages you know, with muscular uh, energy. So really we wanted to connect and produce a work that um, engages with uh, those tangible, intangible energies. Maybe one key moment in the work, um, reflecting on two tangents uh, that connect the, the, the tangible and the intangible, the work that, um, that we probably all experience, uh, or, or um, moments that we all experience in our work when we dig forward and found this little moment of inspiration that actually connects us to the unknown, the not yet known, and we bring it into presence. And I think that is what the work tries to do, to kind of condense moments into an experiential dimension, opposed to a simple uh, syntax or a technical uh, sort of datum. There are three pendulums, uh, three main pendulums, and um, the large one uh, orbits above the field and is driven by um, solar electromagnetic fields from uh, emitted by uh, corner um, eruptions on the uh, solar surface. This is already going too fast. Um, the second pendulum is relating to Earth magnetism and uh, is mapped around uh, polar shifts. And the third pendulum, um, the smallest one, uh, refers to uh, energy that are present in the, in the actual room of the exhibit in form of electromagnetic waves. We have sensors that uh, measures that energy. So the, those energy fields are condensed into an experiential uh, dimension. Um, we have here plan layout. We worked with uh, the Fibonacci uh, calculus to define the structure uh, of the plan. Maybe a side note, interesting to know that Fibonacci approximated his numeric series based on uh, observing rabbit um, population growth and then approximated uh, the numbers uh, accordingly. We all know the story of digital fabrication and the fascination when the, uh, the digital file actually becomes material. And that fine intersection, which is inevitable in prototypal work where the creator actually has to invest physically with the making. And I think we really experienced that in this project, that in spite of the most advanced 
technological digital fabrication of 3D printing, laser cutting, and so forth, actually what really makes the work is the, the investment of uh, um, personal uh, sort of fabrication um, of the piece. The, the project is organized in three or four layers, I should say. Um, the top layer um, being so-called a clock that uh, senses and emits the various energy levels onto the layers of the pendulums, of the three main pendulums. And the three main pendulums then uh, activate the layer below, the 233 pendulum, into this dynamic energy field. This being the neural map uh, that explains the electronics for whoever is interested in how the different sensor technologies and data streams are being converged into this sort of uh, dynamic operation. Again, the fabrication and uh, the patient it takes to actually physically uh, assemble and uh, conceive uh, the parts. Uh, the, the ceiling rig, we have three of them that incorporates light, sensor technology, the EMF sensors, uh, the motors that activate uh, the, the pendulums, and the camera that observe and map the actual field. And I really, really like that image because it kind of shows our laboratory work, which really deals with the nearly visible or nearly invisible, um, and the, the work that it takes to calibrate, to map, to explore this very fine line between what you can actually see and what you can't see. And um, working with different ways of output, one being, of course, the dynamic field, together with overlaid with sound and overlaid with a visual. And um, artist Adam Ferris produced this rather extraordinary uh, in C++ written visualization that takes on the visual mapping into yet another level of output. So together, the dynamic field, together with the sound and the light, uh, creates this what we call imun curli, which uh, is drawn from the Latin word um, the lowest point in the sky where the two tangents meet to this extraordinary moment of inspiration. Um, the, the project has a whole bunch of people that worked on it. Um, I should give special thanks to the students that um, unexceptionally reproduced an extraordinary uh, work. And I hope you do visit us. Uh, we are located um, on the second floor in the photo lab next to the ETH guys. Uh, with the bio uh, experiments, and uh, please come and uh, check us out there. Thank you. So, um, I guess there's lots of announcements going on, but I have to make this next one, and this one is kind of important too because if. Uh, well, there's people in the back that's trying to listen to the presentation and um, the s noise in the back is just a little loud and I guess the sound system is not letting them hear. Um, so if you, when the presentations are going on, if the people are talk that are talking in the back can just be a little bit quieter, that would be great. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna introduce our next pre presenters. Uh, this, uh, the, our next presenters are Jonathan Davison, Nimesh Mystery, Minesh Patel, and uh, they're they're from the University of Nottingham, and their the, their presentation title is Astley Castle. Oh. And the, so apparently there's one bus leaving now. If you really want to leave now. <laughs> Uh, I'm Nimesh, that's Minesh, and that's JD, just uh, to avoid confusion. Okay, so tonight we'll be talking about Astley Castle in Warwickshire. Uh, Warwickshire isn't particularly known for its meat pies. Um, the top image is the Bank of England, circa 1830. Um, the bottom image is 2013 Sterling Prize winner Astley Castle as it stands today. Um, now, if we step back in time, we have John Soane and uh, Joseph Gandhi's masterful drawing of the Bank of England, drawn as a ruin, uh, or in other words, a meat pie with the crust removed. Below, 
Astley Castle, uh, as it stood some six years ago, uh, 30 years, a ruin. Um, now, in its current guise, Astley Castle is a holiday home which can sleep up to eight people within its 800-year-old fabric. Um, hailed, as a new hailed as a prototype for a bold and new attitude towards restoration and reuse, the architects have been uh, allowed to breathe new life into an otherwise redundant but an ancient monument. Um, so let's take a look around. Uh, you enter via an eastern courtyard, two Roman-style oculi, leave this space open to the elements. When guests walk inside, they're met by a beautifully crafted staircase. The, the four bedrooms stem off from this foyer. Now, when they first enter, guests can liberally drop their bags and eddy around the staircase to call shotgun on the room that they want without the, uh, without the slightest hesitation about removing their muddy footwear. This is because the stone tiled floors are easy to clean during the guest changeover and linen swap phase. Uh, okay, and then the central staircase teases an enclosure of the medieval castle turret. Uh, it elevates you out of the dark foyer and into the light open plan living room and kitchen. Here you can enjoy panoramic views of the neighboring Arbury Church and the fortified surrounds. This place never feels stuffy. Uh, the historic stone walls are allowed to breathe. Uh, these same stone walls um, tell a story of time, uh, a conversation through the generations, if you will. Uh, this reading should provide ample enjoyment since there is no TV and no Wi-Fi. Uh, winter renters are spoiled by the opportunity of lighting a fire. I'll pass it on to Minesh. Um, the castle lies on the outskirts of the small village of Astley uh, in North Warwickshire, a picturesque rural location in the English countryside. Uh, encircled by a moat, the castle is entered over a small bridge. To the southwest is the Church of St. Mary, of which there are fantastic views from within the castle. Uh, the castle has undergone eight centuries of alteration and reuse, including a royal mansion house, a garrison, a hotel. Um, these changes are evident in the evolution of the plans. Originally, the castle appears solid and defensive, with little punctuation in the structure. Over the centuries, it has become softer and more porous, signifying the transition from fortification to family home. The castle lay as a ruin until 2003, when a competition was launched to create a holiday home. Um, with, with the Watson man's entry stood out as it proposed weaving new br brickwork in between the existing building fabric. The usual approach to ruins such as Astley Castle would be to faithfully restore, but in this project, the approach was to conserve and reinvent, a similar strategy used in the Noyes Museum. It's particularly appropriate as the castle isn't of a particular time, and so this newest edition can be seen as the latest in a continuing process of adaptation that has been going on for over 800 years. The architects have flipped the conventional house arrangement by having uh, bedrooms on the ground floor and kitchen and living areas upstairs. This took advantage of the increased ruination and open structure of the upper level, maximizing views out and allowing light to flood into the living spaces. It also dealt with the limited light available on the ground floor. Another concept used was that of the Russian doll. The renovation can be divided into three main components. The existing structure, a new brick diaphragm which stabilizes the ruin, and a timber joinery which forms the new ceiling and room partitions. These are all inserted within one another, acting as a glue, consolidating the building. Hi guys. Um, so a bit about the materials. The layered effect of the architectural insertion at Astley is carried through to the material palette. Materials were chosen to complement the exposed surfaces of the retained castle, so metals and plastics were out in favour of natural earthy components, brick, timber, tile, that respect and enhance the ancient context. Brickwork matches the existing red sandstone and is contrasted with laminated oak and birch faced ply. Black terracotta on the floors and the hearths here is bordered with precast concrete to give a crisp yet sympathetic effect. The tactile oak of the staircase conceals a twisting steel rail that guides users upwards. A long narrow brick from Denmark was specified for the new walls to better accommodate the ragged interfaces with the old fabric. Uh, a Flemish garden wall bond was used here in lime mortar, which gives a precise contrast with the decaying sandstone and plaster. Looking a bit more inside, um, in the internal um, rooms, the brick and tile bands here are used to transition between the insert walls and the timber panelling. 
both the visual and the practical detail to prevent the moisture coming in from the existing sandstone. Everything is stepped to overcome the lack of the straight edges and alignment, but it also adds to the effect of texture and history. In several places, new oak windows are set in behind the weathered stone tracery of the originals, giving a curiously sort of surreal double framing or a kind of surveying of the landscape as if the castle is now a tool for looking. So as mentioned, it won the, the Sterling Prize. This is named after the late Sir James Sterling. The annual prize of the RIBA recognizes the greatest contribution to the evolution of architecture. Never a favorite among the short list of six, Astley Castle was a surprise victory this year that reinforces the need for building recovery and reuse. This Arcadia conference has largely considered advances in technology, researches and material to realize adaptive architecture. However, this project demonstrates that the adaption of existing buildings is just as key. Here, a ruined castle has been cleverly been brought back to life that allows its guests to experience both the ancient and the contemporary. Thanks. So our next presenters are Michael Ramrau and Matt Fielding. Uh, and the title of their presentation, they're also from Nottingham and Mars Studio. And their title is Prototyping Architecture Form and the, oh, Fabric Form Work. Hello. Okay, ready? Okay, this presentation is based on a two-day fabric format workshop, which was undertaken by Studio Mars from the University of Nottingham, UK. This was led by Michael Stacey, our unit professor, curator of the Prototyping Architecture exhibition as part of Arcadia. In line with the theme of Prototyping Architecture, the purpose of this workshop was to design, build, and cast concrete architectural elements. This aspires to combine craft and technology, often missing in many contemporary construction processes, creating a dialogue between process and form. Before we begin our explanation of what Fabric Formic is, we'd like to show an example from the previous year. This is a workshop of the tri tripartite Fabric Formic column, which was assembled and cast by the students of Mars last year and Anameta's guidance. It is an example of the in-situ concrete cast in a geotextile formwork. Fabric formwork is a new construction method for concrete structures that utilizes sheets of fabric as flexible, lightweight molds. This allowed deflection of the surface under pressure makes the membrane an efficient uh, formwork material. The technique encourages an architectural understanding of concrete as material and as a process. The fabric can only resist the forces generated by the concrete through tension, and thus the form produced relies on controlling the reaction of the fabric. Gravity then becomes a tool to be exploited in the gener in generation of form rather than something that is resisted as in conventional formwork systems. The two-day workshop focused on generic architectural forms, such as a wall, vault, column, beam, and furniture. These terminologies gave direction to the studies However, a different classification developed more concern with the process rather than the object produced. That's not quite 40 seconds. The emphasis of this process was to draw, to make, and to make, to draw simultaneously. The limited time scale forced our designs to be instinctive. We designed using the resources available, thus informing the limits of our design. Through sketching, diagramming, and making, we develop the designs through iteration. <clears throat> Here are a selection of images that depict that process. The top middle image represents a proposal for either a roof or wall geometry. The lower left image shows a small maquette of the beam design using tissue paper to represent the fabric and string to represent the tension wire. Next slide, hopefully. Is it playing? After that one. There you go. 
So using the materials available, the designs were perfected through scale drawing. Once the design team had agreed upon a prototype, they began to construct the formwork. Making the formwork forced, it, forced the designs into constructible objects. This is an example of the fabric formwork beam. The primary materials used were lengths of softwood timber, sheet plywood, multi-directional fabric, it's the formwork, tension wires, rebar, and reinforcing mesh. This was all assembled using screws and brackets made possible by the workshop at the University of Waterloo. Using the wall and vault team, you can see the example of an expressive formwork structure. Even though we used very linear, conventional formwork elements, we were able to make a non-linear concrete geometry when combined with the fabric. The top left image, that shows the wall structure in its most basic form. The nature of liquid concrete results in a negotiation between the concrete and a flexible membrane. It structurally organizes itself to a form that achieves equilibrium in relation to its load. As you can see, the membrane was tested using water in order to better understand how the fabric might respond. Tension wires were used for the bench design to control the fluid. Here you can see the completed formwork for the five architectural elements. Each formwork needed to be self-supporting as well as being able to support the load of the poured concrete. This was completed by the morning of the second day in preparation for the casting in the afternoon. Here you can see the teams mixing the concrete in a cement mixer. We used a ready-mixed cement containing sand, cement and aggregate. We added, we added water until the mix it reached a, a porridge-like consistency. As you can see on the right of the pouring channel on the, team, uh, the beam team, design was restricted and we needed, we needed to account for that. But generally, when pouring the concrete into the mold, it required vibrating to force any excess air. This was achieved through patting the filled fabric, which you can see on the lower right here. We also used battens to vibrate the concrete mixture to force air out of it. This process took around about an hour. So here, here you can see some of the completed casts. On the left, you've got the wall. And on the upper right, you can see the furniture. And on the lower right, um, example of the beam. It's worth noting that all concrete elements were cast in situ and left to cure for three days. These Im images, images sorry, illustrate the porous nature of the fabric. This allows any excess water or air to seep out, which means the surface of the concrete is much stronger because the release of this excess from the mix lowers the ratio of water to cement in the concrete surface. <clears throat> Once the designs are cured, we began a process of removing the formwork known as striking. On the left, you can see the furniture group unveiling the cast chair, the beam being unveiled on the top right and the wall on the lower right. <clears throat> It's worth noting again, one of the key considerations of the design was to make the formwork deconstructible. This meant that the design teams had to consider simple things like the placement of screws, fixings, and structural cables. As you can see, the process required various methods of removal. This design process wasn't perfect in its entirety, but it shows a consequence of the dialogue between process and form. And to quote um, our professor, Michael Stacey, um, prototyping architecture demonstrates that inventiveness has not been lost within architecture. Both architecture and technology are malleable in the hands of a well-informed architect. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll, my name is Christopher Romano. I'm a faculty in, at Buffalo, my, and my colleagues are Nicholas Brucia, who will be presenting uh, this project, Project 2XMT, tomorrow morning. So uh, although uh, I want to talk about the project, I, I can't so much. So I'm going to talk instead uh, a little bit about uh, Buffalo, the way we tend to work, and uh, a couple of other things that happened throughout the process. Uh, so uh, we've been building a lot with sheet metal and many, many more details to come tomorrow uh, early in the morning, and I hope to see you all there. 
So this, the studio uh, environment, we tend to work uh, at a lot of different scales, and we work all, all the time, uh, a lot, lots and lots of failures. So all the models that tip over, that one didn't work, that one didn't work either. Then the one on the left got a little bit better, the one Nick currently has on the right-hand side of the image. And so as we work all the time, and the the, the Taha group can, can maybe help me out with this muffin, um, because they're also quite tired. Uh, we tend to find new uses for tools. So in this case, we, we, we crushed this Tim Hortons muffin. We couldn't resist on the way I passed about nine Tim Hortons, so we, we just had to stop. Um, and then we, we kind of flipped back. We had to get the digital model done about six o'clock in the morning. So, so we work uh, between all these platforms, between drawing, making, paper, uh, AutoCAD, whatever we can really get our hands on. But the goal in the work we do is, is to make things and to build things. So here you see the, the load test we, we rigged up to the building, uh, our, our first prototype down in the basement in Buffalo, and we tugged on it until failure. You can kind of see the two images on the right, and uh, I'm up here looking, turned sideways, trying to read the dial, which is upside down. We didn't do such a good job. And then when we get to the site, um, we worked at, uh, amongst this really great place we call Silo City. We recently moved our studio down there. You'll see a bit of the workshop in a second. Um, and kind of Nick fighting back nature with the, the weed whacker and then uh, kind of clearing out some land for the prototype that uh, you saw earlier and we'll talk about again tomorrow. And then the, the fuel efficient pickup truck up top. Uh, the way we, we, we tend to move the generator when we don't have a pickup truck all the time. And then we get better though. We, we find the mule and the gator. It's, it's a Kawasaki that, that's really, really amazing. And um, you, you kind of get a sense of we're, we're working predominantly with uh, folding metal. Uh, press breaking, a whole series of panels. The mock-up we, we worked on was uh, 152 uh, unique panels, uh, ultra, ultra thin gauges, uh, trying to find self-supporting solutions using thin gauge metal. And occasionally we make, we make quite a bit of mistakes and we tend to have a laugh and, and a drink and, and that'll, that'll come at the end of this. Um, we, I once showed up in sandals to the, the fabricators uh, workshop and they became quite upset so they wrote us this really amazing email that we, we still laugh about. Um, and now we always wear boots when we go into the factory. So at FYI, I always wear boots when you go to a fabricator shop. Um, and then we flip back and we, we, we start working with us. Nick's looking a little, a little bit tired here. And um, we do a lot of work ourselves. So the, fabrica the fabrication of the panels happened by our collaborators, who we are tremendously thankful for. Um, but then we do the welding and step in at all the other steps. Um, so you can see here the, the project 2XMT. Uh, we also always try to name things. We're kind of quite obsessive with, with acronyms, and I'll, I'll drop a few more on you before we leave. And, and, then we, and then we tend to text message all the time because none of us pick up our phones. So, and they always start serious, like, you know, when are the drawings going to be done? And then they always end up with, like, potential critiques of the suburbs. <laughs> we don't really know why these things happen or wh why the dog ate our frisbee. Uh, <laughs> so, but then back again to work, that's always, that's the key. We, we go back and forth and back and forth and we can only stay serious for so long, as, as you can tell based on this talk. Um, <laughs> But, but the project, uh, anyways, was built, and so you're getting a kind of, oh, and then we brought a GoPro. Uh, <laughs> so that's Nick, myself, and Dan, and Phil, the, the, the four uh, our research assistants that worked with us on this project. And uh, it, we, we did use the GoPro. Um, for, for better things than this, uh, which you'll see here. So then we, this is the workshop that we conducted on Monday and Tuesday. It's one of the reasons why we haven't slept very much, uh, but it was an amazing opportunity. Very thankful to uh, Philip and Mike and Omar for that opportunity. And so we created a studio down at, at the silos, which hopefully will be working uh, a bit more. And then uh, the opening, which was very recently, just a, a week or so ago, uh, we, we had this idea we needed to light up the project because, the, because you wouldn't see it at the time of the opening. We, we didn't plan that part so well. Um, so we, we overlaid the, the, the structural analysis on top of 
Uh, I've lost that one. Um, <laughs> but, it, but okay, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and and we you know we do some smart things like we place the project in the absolute windiest place uh, at, at the edge, the eastern edge of Lake Erie. Uh, so to really push the project to an extreme, you know, why not? And then. And then we're now in this process of waiting to see what happens to it. So, and it's still standing, so we're, we're quite happy about that. And the snails, they love it. Uh, so, and we always laugh about, you get a sense here of, of the, the detailing and the things that, that are really critical to us. Um, and, and obviously work, work like this uh, takes, takes quite a bit of collaborators, really intense collaboration between academia and industry. So I wanted to end with a bit, big cheers because that's, again, how we do that. So cheers. Thank you, everyone. So, okay, so we're at our last presentation for tonight. And our presenter is Andrew Cole, and he is from the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. And, and the project that he's going to present is the Cube, which is right over there. <laughs> okay, so welcome, Andrew. All right. Oh. <clears throat> oh, wow, okay. Uh, late night sleeps. All right. Well, thank you very much um, for the presentation instead of being Hello? Hello. Can anybody hear me? Unique New York. Unique New York. Um, so uh, this is kind of a great honor uh, presenting at this convention. We wanted to put together this installation here for Acadia. Um, our talk was going to be very informal. And uh, what, what this is is a student or undergraduate student initiative under the guiding eye of FormLab. Now FormLab is a graduate uh, initiative uh, doing research and design collaboration with computational efforts. Uh, in this image, we see one of FormLab's previous uh, installations uh, called Field Guy 1 is installed. Uh, what we were trying to achieve with this installation is that's a very, uh, an intensive amount of work that had to uh, take place in a very short period of time as all of us landed just in September and we had about five weeks to throw this all together. So we went and we wanted to have every part of the undergrad community taking place in this. So we held design charrettes and workshops and just trying to create this amazing environment of students teaching students, trying to create this wonderful installation to represent the undergraduate body. You can see here we have uh, put up some uh, the sketches that we accumulated during the design charrette, uh, where we got some ideas of how we wanted our components to possibly be laid out, uh, how we possibly want to configure the space. Uh, one thing what we kind of didn't have available to us at the time of our, the beginning of the installation is the uh, conception of uh, where our site was going to be. So you can see in the previous sketches that it's kind of all over the place. So we decided to contain our installation in a cube, and then we can just then drop this cube wherever we wanted uh, it to be. So the one thing that I kind of want to mention is that our project wasn't really meant to innovate. We're all very young and getting our feet wet into this whole uh, computational design process. So there was a lot of learning taking place, and that's what was so great about the process of this installation. We had everyone uh, taking part in hardware and software meetings, learning how to write Arduino co code, learning how to handle wiring, uh, work with the laser cutters, work with the CNC, and then once we hit about two weeks prior, everything was just a go. We just full sprint mode. We, our, our motto was, we have 13 days, hold on to your pants. We're just going to run. And so we, in these images, we show just like, everything that took place. We had CNC uh, panels cut and painted uh, with every set of hands we could find posting and every bit of social media we could find and uh, <laughs> just get, get things going. Um, we, uh, the next image, oh yes. So the laser cutter components, uh, if you've taken a peek at the cube, we've got a lot of hexacons up there, 700 to be precise. We were trying to achieve this inside the canopy uh, or inside the cube, this canopy that is very intimate and uh, interactive in the sense where you lose this, the, the context of your surroundings. So when you reach into this space, it really feels like a, a greater motion or a greater environment. And so we just go back to like, to achieve this goal, we needed so many hands and so many, uh, uh, to just get the students involved in this. It always felt like this type of uh, 
computational research was just always a, a step above the undergraduate level. So we wanted to get everyone involved and get as many hands as possible. So as you can see here, once we got the peel and the, the laser cut pieces all peeled, started to lay them out and construct our components. And just like any initiative that's starting off from uh, the ground up, we hit a lot of walls. The one being this canopy, beautiful, very heavy. <laughs> so when we started getting to our Arduino boards and our casings and our servos and trying to set up all the componentry to it, we ran into the, uh, the, kit, the, the question that the kit of parts, could it operate the way we wanted it to? And if you've played with the cube, you'll notice that not quite there yet. We're still learning on it. But as you can see, we just had so many people working on this cube, and we're just also very proud of the amount of effort that was put towards this project. So we, as you can see, two days to go, two days ago, we didn't have anything in this room ready for this. And it was a mad dash of wiring, using all the bit of resources we had available to us, uh, because everyone was busy in the university trying to set up for this conference. It was just an amazing, uh, I guess, an accomplishment for all of us uh, to get it to where we were. One day to go, this morning even, <laughs> clicking away, plugging in wires, snapping away the components, realizing another wall, servos can't lift the canopy, too heavy. All right, we'll break the canopy apart. New module, adaptive architecture. We adapt, architecture moves. Here's our time lapse of about 24 hours of us clicking away in 20 seconds. So, blink. <laughs> um, so we have installed in our cube at 12 sensor points, uh, a sharp IR sensor, running to an Arduino board that was mapping uh, the distance value to a position in a servo rotation. With the componentry being quite heavier than we then tested as the modules clipped away from each other, we managed to uh, damage a couple of servos, hence the unplugging. And this is just part of the learning process. So we were very, we were very excited to see everything move, we were also very disappointed when everything stopped moving. <laughs> and when we plug it in again, we look forward to having it moving once more. We do have footage of everything operating, and it's so incredibly photogenic. So I, we just really wanted to share with you this incredible process of how, uh, of how hard all the undergrads worked at putting together this cube in such a short period of time and that we're all incredibly proud and excited about the potential and opportunities left in this computational design and the, uh, in the operable and adaptive architectural field. And we wish to get more of us working towards this, uh, in, in this fashion of making and reiterating and enjoying the technology that's available to us. And we could only wish we could get our hands on it sooner so we could have had more time to keep playing with this technology. And I believe I'm at my 20 slides. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.